fact that the PFP and DFP joint motion is occurs in synchrony. So let's spend a couple of minutes and discuss how coordinated motion across two different size joints can occur. This, this to me is a very curious phenomenon. The radius at the PIP joint is one-third larger than that at the DIP joint. So here we have a larger joint and a smaller joint. Now we know that when a tendon moves across the joint, it the amount of movement is in relationship both to the size as well as to the distance of the movement or the amount of movement. So here we not only have a large joint, but we have a joint that usually goes about 110 degrees into flexion, whereas here is a much smaller joint that goes maybe 60, 70 into flexion. So we have two adjacent joints across which this dorsal apparatus uh, goes simultaneously, and yet one is bigger and moves further than the other. This creates a complex challenge biomechanically for a system that will allow equal movement of these two joints. Well, we know that if we took the lateral band, which normally lies laterally, and if we moved it dorsally at the PIP joint, we know it would never be long enough to allow both PIP and DIP joint flexion. The reason that we can flex both of these joints is the lateral band doesn't go dorsally over the top of the PIP joint, but it is lateral at the PIP joint and it moves even more volarly during PIP flexion. So it's really the lateral band shift that allows this. When this lateral band moves volarly at the PIP joint, it removes tension from the lateral band. Remember, it would have greatest tension had it, if it had to go dorsally. And that decrease in tension is what gives the lateral band the ability to go over the dorsum of the DIP joint during full DIP joint flexion. So what the lateral band does at the PIP joint is what creates the ability for the DIP joint to fully flex. Do you recall early on in this presentation we said that finger flexion is modulated by the dorsal apparatus and what's happening. If this does not happen in the dorsal apparatus then finger flexion is not possible. This is a graph redrawn from Arbuckle and McGrather in 1995 and they have plotted the motion of the PIP and DIP joints in female right index fingers, showing us that except in the very beginning there is a constant relationship between the amount of PIP and DIP joint flexion. This is a rather fun thing to try. Place two of your fingers together where the middle phalanx is resting together. Now in this posture Try your very best to extend the DIP joints in full extension. And you will immediately appreciate that it's physically impossible. Because without PIP joint extension and proximal excursion of this portion of the dorsal apparatus, tension cannot be directed to the terminal tendon insertion to extend the DIP joint. They must move together. Therefore, one of the important concepts to remember is if there is any decrease or increase of motion, meaning a lack of full motion or an excess of motion at either interphalangeal joint, it will change the balance so that it affects the other joint. We see this so commonly, a mallet finger secondarily creates a swan neck deformity or hyperextension of the PIP joint and a boutonniere injury where there is an inability to extend the PIP joint directs the force and creates DIP joint hyperextension. 
So our goal is to appreciate this constant balance between the interphalangeal joint movement and, at, and as we're treating a patient to work to reestablish the balance, not just focusing on one joint. If we block the DIP joint in flexion by taping a small piece of material that is bent to the shape of, the, of DIP flexion, what we will see is we increase the tension in the lateral band and therefore the lateral band is a better participant in PIP joint extension. This is a particularly useful exercise following a boutonniere injury when you really want the lateral band to move as far dorsally as possible. 